This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. Before we get to today's show, I just want to talk about Stamps.com. Getting your mailing and your shipping done can seem like a no-win situation. Going to the post office takes a valuable time. Leasing a postage meter, that's expensive. Well, luckily I know a better way, Stamps.com. You can buy and print your own official U.S. postage for any letter or any package. It's more powerful than a postage meter. You can avoid those time-consuming trips to the post office. And I personally use Stamps.com. And actually, you could too if you if, if you listen to the BS Report, which you obviously do because you're listening to this. If you use the promo code BS for this special no-risk trial, it, it is a $110 bonus offer and includes a digital scale up to $55 of free postage. Um, all you have to do is go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in BS. Stamps.com. Check it out. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report, taping this on a Thursday morning here in Southern California. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Bill Don't Lie NBA podcast every Monday, do that now. We have two Grantland basketball hours coming next week, Thursday, 7 p.m. ESPN, Friday, 7 p.m. ESPN, a double-barreled playoff preview. Bunch of fun people on that one, so stay tuned for that. Right now, uh, the world's most favorite basketball gambler, Harala Bob Valgaris. How are you? Hey, Bill. How you doing? Um... Would you give this season a thumbs up from a gambling standpoint? Where where do you stand? Uh, I would give it like a thumbs in the middle. I would suppose hasn't been the best year, hasn't been the worst year. Just kind of bit of more of a struggle, I suppose, this year than than, than it has been in the last few years. Er- what what are the reasons? Uh, are there erratic trends? Are there things that you couldn't figure out, or too many injuries? What happened? I don't know. To be honest. Um, there could be a bunch of different reasons, maybe just uh, burnout reasons, just traveling a little bit too much maybe for me, maybe not spending as much time as I have been in the past. That could be that could be part of it. I could mm. just be behind the curve. I might not be good anymore. That could be part of it. Or oh, no, you're could, washed up. I could be washed up. I could be past my prime. I'm going to be 40 soon. It's probably not wow. the right side of where you want to be when you're when you're trying to use your brain for things. But um, it's been a good year. It hasn't, just, hasn't been as good a year as it has been in the past, that's for sure. Is it possible that uh, all the people who decide the lines are just getting a little bit smarter and have more data and things like that? Um, I don't know if it's the people who are making the lines. I think what's probably happened is the people who are betting, the, the lines makers have, have gotten smarter at opening their market at lower limits and yep. using the sharper bettors who bet in the morning with smaller bankrolls to um, to make their lines better. And I think what's happened is is a lot of the smaller overnight market and early morning market is being, is being bet by more and more new sharps who don't have big enough bankrolls or don't want to wait till later on in the day to bet more. And so it's become like a game theory thing where everyone is scared that if they don't bet this game at 7 in the morning, someone else is going to bet it, so they might as well bet it anyways. And so the market's are getting sharper and, and I don't particularly bet that early. I bet later in the day usually. Yeah. Um just because I'm waiting for the markets to mature a little bit more. So I, I think it's a combination of just the overall market getting smarter. The probably the bookmakers have gotten smarter because of that. And um and then uh, the year has been a little bit un- unpredictable. There's been some weird things with um a home court advantage has kind of wildly fluctuated which may or may not be random. There's the league just kind of had this period in, in part of the year where the game was kind of officiated differently for a little bit, and that could have been random also. Um, but yeah, you say I mean, could it, have. It, you say could have been random. I mean, it could have been. It could. It might not have been. I'm not sure. It could have been a mandate to make. I'm not sure. I mean, now I, if I were to speculate, I would. I would say that it probably wasn't random, but that's that's me. I would think that there. But I don't know the reason for it. I think maybe. If, again, speculating, I think maybe uh, some of these three-hour TV games might not have been too exciting for the league, and with all the instant replay, and I think they might have, you know, they experimented in the summertime with a shorter actual game, a 44-minute exhibition game, and I think maybe in January they decided they're just going to experiment with 
a 48 minute game that just went by a lot faster because there was going to be less fouls called. So that might. Have so been you you also. saw unequivocally in January for whatever reason uh, there were just less fouls in every game. Yeah, in December and January there was the game was called a little bit differently for sure. The, the game was a little bit quicker. There was a lot a lot more contact tolerated. I would say early on, maybe when the game wasn't as important. I mean, maybe not in the last few minutes or whatever, but definitely you know early in the third quarter, or first quarter, second quarter, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, but it, but again, it could have been random. It could have been hey, it could be these teams are just shooting more three pointers, therefore there's no fouls. That's possible also, but I I don't think so. I don't think you and I have talked on the podcast about home court advantage and what's happened to it. Zach and I have talked about it a couple of times and you know, there's all kinds of theories. Officiating's better, uh, chartered travel, the the guys know how to sleep and eat the right food now. Uh you have more opposing fans in in home arenas because of StubHub and all these different variables that allow fan like people on their cell phones the entire game. Yeah, the, the the crowd experience has really changed. People are less mean just in general. I remember like, you know, the 70s and the 80s, the crowd really affected games. And I think there's only a couple crowds now that actually affect games. Do you, what do you think the variables are? What do you, how would you rank them? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that – I mean, I've never really been a big believer in actual traveling, uh, like just one trip being like a big deal like everyone made you know everyone made a big deal of portland going into brooklyn and losing that game and it was like oh they had to travel co- cross country for one yeah. game and, and but i tweeted but they do that all the time um they had a day off in between travel and when they decided to play so i don't think that's a big as big a deal as people make it up to be like the, the actual time you spend on an airplane i think it's more of just like a cumulative bouncing around between time zones going back and forth um, the amount of, of 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 rest you get, like just the, the the fact that the games are being teams are playing like I think there was I forget which team it was, but they had, they were going to be playing like six games in eight days, eight games in in eleven days, twelve days. I think that's more of where you where you might see some some of it. So I don't I don't know if that's it. I don't think the home crowd really does a lot. I don't think during the regular season, like you said, there's a couple of arenas where seems like it has an effect but for the most part when i watch a game i don't really feel the crowd during the regular season i'm not like oh wow they're really intimidated but it happens in the playoffs for sure yeah um, I agree. but in the regular season i think people are just kind of it's another game it's not that big of a deal um, maybe there's some rivalries where it happens like maybe when the clippers go to golden state golden state crowd which is always pretty good gets a little bit more ramped up yeah um, but yeah i'm not sure one of the things I love about your Twitter feed is you you, you just are, are very, very candid about your feelings on coaches. And you and I usually, I would say nine out of ten times, you and I are aligned on a coach. Like, I, I thought Brad Stevens was incredible this year. And, uh, yeah, you were to, on that very early. Yeah, um, I just, even last year, you were, you were talking about how, like, going into the season, I think you thought he was going to be very good after what he did last year, so... Yeah, he's he's has a way of making chicken salad out of chicken, whatever that expression is. Um, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. And you know, Rondo really held the team hostage those first couple months because he wanted to play a certain way. He wanted to do that pace and space thing. And uh, and once Rondo got out of there, it it really kind of transformed how that you shouldn't get better by trading Rajon Rondo for Jay Crowder. But the Celtics got much better. You shouldn't get better for trading Jeff Green for a first-round pick, but they got better. Um, where does he rank for you on, on, like, the top six coaches? For, like, um, actual in-game stuff and preparing a team to play, uh, he's, 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 like, in the top. He's right up there at the very top. Um, they're just the stuff that they do. I don't think I've ever watched a game where I've been, like, frustrated with something that he's done because I think it's, I just, I get that a lot, like four or five times a game with some coaches and with him, I was just thinking, I don't think there's been any instances to see. There's been times I've been watching where he's like done something that is game theory correct, but it's been terrible for my bet, but that's just me being biased, right? Like the idea that they just keep on fouling forever is kind of can be a little bit frustrating when you have a, a bet like minus seven and a half and they're, or we have a plus the Celtics plus seven and a half and they're down eight 
and they're still they score a basket with like two seconds left and still foul. That can be like a little irritating, but um, it's not bad coaching by any stretch. Uh, so yeah, he's up there right at the very very top. He um, the team just plays really well. Like they know what types of plays to run against a certain team. There, it's more of an offensive thing than a defensive thing. I haven't been entirely impressed with his defense, but then you look at he's playing like Kelly Olynyk, Jared Sollinger, Brandon Bass. Right. Uh, they don't have a center at all. They don't have they're not just a center, but they don't have anyone of their bigs that can actually play defense, can protect the paint, and yet they still do okay defensively because they play a good scheme. I mean, think, imagine playing. They had a stretch where they played Isaiah Thomas and Avery Bradley together, and then they had like whoever in the middle, and then their center was Brandon Bass or their center was a Jared Sollinger, with and he was the biggest player on the court. With yeah. Jay Crowder playing the four and maybe Evan Turner playing the three, and yet they played good defensively. That's almost amazing in some ways. They have no rim protection at all, and the smarter uh, teams yeah. have just, you know, like what Detroit was doing yesterday. When you have Drummond and Monroe out there and you're posting up those guys, that's actually great for the Celtics because the worst yeah. case scenario is when you spread the floor on them and you just attack the rim because it's yeah. a layup line. Cleveland. Yeah. That's why in round one, I would, you know, I hope the Celts make the playoffs for a variety of reasons. But playing Cleveland in round one is just an impossible task for them. You know, not only because Cleveland's one of the best three or four teams in the league now, but just at any point in a Cleveland game, LeBron or Kyrie is just going to be able to get to the rim and get a layup or a dunk, and they they just yeah. won't be able to stop it. Against Atlanta, it's a little more interesting, right? Like they have the same kind of guards who can get to the rim, and that's what their team's built around. But if you can contain that a little bit, they've had some success against Atlanta. Like, they beat them two months ago. Very similar systems. And uh, I'm not saying this could resemble your your, your famous 2007 Warriors-Mavs bet. But I, I don't think if Millsap's shoulder is hurt and Cephalosha ends up missing some of the playoffs, and, you know, there, there's a scenario here where that could be a little bit of a scary series for, for Atlanta. Or am I insane? I don't think anyone really thinks Atlanta's that great. <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, I don't think you're insane, I guess would be a quick way to answer that question. Um, I don't, people don't look at Atlanta and think that they're like, I mean, you already said Cleveland's better than Atlanta. Golden State's better than Atlanta. I mean, people just look at Atlanta and think that what they did was great, but they really aren't that great of a team. Um, and, and but you I liked kind of, Atlanta. Like a, two months ago, you liked Atlanta. No, I still do like Atlanta. I'm just saying people in general won't think of it as a big upset because because right. it's Atlanta. And it's not. It's not. They don't have like a dominant superstar. Um, yeah, I, I think Atlanta is, is is good for sure. I, I, the thing, I, the problem I have with Atlanta is like they've been trying to work in these players the last few months, and I think it's kind of damaged a little bit of what they're doing. Like I don't think you can play Kent Bazemore twenty to. 25 minutes a game and expect to have like your unselfish ball movement and your good team defense because he's just not that type of player. I, I'm not yeah. I dislike Kent Bazemore. I just think that the difference between playing like a Kent Bazemore versus when they were playing Tabo when before Tabo got injured, that's a pretty big difference. And so now if they go into the playoffs where they where they don't have Tabo and they have to play Kent Bazemore, I think that that could be bad for them. Um, and, and also then, if Millsap, if even if Millsap plays, but he's seventy percent instead of a hundred percent, the way that te- that team is built like a house of cards, you know, they need every piece of that to get to the level that they've gotten to. Yeah, exactly. You, they don't have a very big margin. All, it's going to hurt. Yeah, yeah, they don't have a very big margin for error. So I, I don't know. I don't. I think Boston doesn't match up with them. Look, the East is a complete dumpster fire. There's two teams that are good, and the rest of the teams, I don't think anyone cares about. And I, I, I for sure feel that way. I just, I want to get to the Eastern Conference Finals and see the, the Cavs versus the, the the Hawks, if that's who it is, and maybe Bulls versus Cavs might be exciting in the second round. But like, does anyone care about Toronto, Washington, the rest of the teams no. that are like they're all terrible? That I, I want, my, I want Indiana to make the playoffs just because I want to see if maybe they could grind a team down into salt or something. That might be exciting. Um. But I don't, I don't see them. I don't see any other team really. I don't even think the two teams are that. Like, I don't even think Atlanta and Cleveland are that, that, that exciting to watch. Although Cleveland, I guess, is. The if you look at the championship odds, it's a really unique season. You have Golden State's plus one eighty. Uh, Cavs are two to one. 
Spurs are like plus 350, and then after that, everyone is 15 to 1, 20 to 1 and higher. So, yeah, that is pretty, it is. Uh, I don't know if that's unique, though. I think that's kind of the way it's always been. I think this year it's more unique in the sense that any team, I feel like a lot more teams could win it. I mean, people were talking about that earlier, for sure. Um, well, usually you have usually you have your, your three top seeds or your three top, your favorites. But then you always have like a couple in that 8 to 1, 10 to 1 range. Right. And this year you don't. And I think people have looked at the Clippers bench. They just crossed them off. I think the Rockets would have gotten there. But, man, they got to lose Beverly and then Monte Yunus, you know, back to back. I, I, I just don't see how they're, they're going to have enough to win four straight playoff rounds. And then Memphis fell off a cliff. What do you think happened to Memphis? Jeff Green. <laughs> wow. And I thought Jeff Green was going to be the difference. Um. Yeah, I don't know if it was Jeff Green. Um, I don't know. It's weird. I think. Yeah, it's it. I mean, it could be it. It a combination of not having Tony Allen and not having um. Uh, Jeff Green, I think, or having Jeff Green, I think, might have might have hurt them a little bit. And then, I don't know. It's weird. They don't have any shooting at all. It seems sometimes like. Courtney Lee is pretty important to that team, which you wouldn't really ever think you'd be uttering that phrase like, wow, we really miss Courtney Lee. But Courtney Lee is pretty pretty big for that team. And he went down for a little bit. And they just haven't really gotten their their mojo. But I don't think anyone is afraid of of them at all. I don't, I'm, it's weird. Whereas I think before, people would be really like, wow, we gotta, bam, we're got we going to have to go through Memphis. That's going to be tough. Memphis is a title contender. And I don't know. It's, it's, it is strange. The game is so cyclical. Some of these teams, they go through runs and then, and then, um, and then the teams just kind of fall. Like right now, I think Memphis is like ten to fourteen to one or something like that. Whereas just a few months ago, the Spurs were like an eight seed <laughs> for a while, and people were thinking they might have a chance to miss the playoffs. And now they've had six straight games that they've won by tw- they've been led, they've led by twenty points and twenty two straight games that they've led by double digits and all these other things. So it's um, it's been a pretty crazy year for sure. I don't I. I don't totally understand the Memphis thing. I, I don't know either. I'm not. A, I was never really a Dave Yeager fan. I kind of liked him, and then yeah. I didn't like him. And he seems really good, but he's. I don't know. It's weird. I, the problem that they have is that they can't. They are not part of the teams that every you know everyone talks about. This you mentioned it, pace and space and spreading the floor out. They just don't do that at all. And I think that the type of style that they play, I think, is more suited to the playoffs. But I tell you, one of the things that has happened is Gasol has completely, Mark Gasol has completely fallen off a cliff offensively in terms of, he was really good earlier in the year. He was hitting from the outside, yeah. which you wouldn't normally think of him as like a big perimeter shooter or like 10 to 15 feet. He was kind of like a Marcus, Ald- the Marcus Aldridge clone for a little while. And now it just looks like he's completely worn down. So they might just be a team that just needs some, needs some rest. Um, or maybe he's got some injuries that I don't know about, but uh, that team is is um, is weird. I don't really know. I don't. I, I do think that they need Tony Allen to play because he's their kind of defensive pulse, and I do think they're starting five when they play Conley, Allen, um, Courtney Lee, and then Zebo and Gasol. I do think that team's really good. You know, they're one of the teams that have done the Spurs thing where they they play a lot of players, a lot of minutes, and so it could just be a function of when they get to the playoffs and those players don't play as many minutes, those, those, those fringe players that they get back to being as good as they were and they'll, they'll be able to capture it again. But I'm not sure. I don't think Jeff Green's the answer. He, you know, he started for a while and then he said he didn't want to start anymore because he could see that he was hurting the team. So they, they took him out of the starting lineup. And he's one of those players. If you watch him, you'll see him make like four or five great plays a game. And you're just like, Oh my God, this guy's terrific. And then you realize that's all he did. The entire game is make those four or five great plays and do everything else. He did was terrible. My dad used so, um, to call him, my dad called him Trick or Treat. He was, initially it was Trick or Treat Tony, and then it was Trick or Treat Jeff Green, but, you know, he'd have 35 one game, and you have three the next game. I thought that was going to be a great thing for Memphis, because they, you know, they when he plays well, you're almost unbeatable, and if he doesn't play well, you have so much anyway, it doesn't matter. But if anything, it, it seemed like it just, it just hasn't worked, and, and I'm with you, I... I thought Marcus Gasol was one of the best five players in the league the first two months of the season, and he just does not look the same. And, and it does kind of feel like, you know, he might be a little banged up or something. Because I, I got my uh, my you know NBA ballot to do all the awards, 
And I was trying to figure out first team all center. I mean, I, I'm sorry for first team all NBA center. And, and, you know, up until about a month ago, it would have been a no brainer. You just write Marcus Solin. Yeah. Now I'm not sure. I mean, that team's still on pace to win 56 games, but I, I don't know. Who, how else would you pick? You can't pick Boogie. No. You can't pick DeAndre. I think you still have to pick Gasol. It's weird, right? I don't know yeah. who else you would pick. Um, you, you can't say Tim Duncan, can you? Because well, he is he is, he's like a power forward. Even I don't know I mean, what he's he like a splitter. They, yeah. They, if 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 you said that he was a center, then you would then you would pick Tim Duncan. That would be the guy you would pick. But because I think he's probably a power forward. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I I think the thing about the West is so much of it depends on who 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 matches up with the other team in the first round. Right. And like a team that like a team like Memphis if they get a favorable matchup in the first round and they get their and they get going a little bit now they got like a little bit of rest and they can start preparing, they could turn it on back and they get healthy. That could help them then they could just get, get right back to the way they were earlier. Um it's interesting, you know, Memphis and Atlanta, those are two teams who peaked early in the year. And then the Spurs, like, Greg Popovich is almost like one of those jockeys who, like, and, and trainers who gets their horse yeah. ready for a big race and, and, and knows exactly when to get his team to peak at the right time, whether it's within a race, if you're the jockey or a trainer who's, who's, who's letting the horse get built up for the race. So I don't know, Memphis might have just peaked at the wrong time, and maybe they can't capture it again. Maybe they can. I'm not sure. I know that a lot of people think the last month of the season isn't, or the last two months of the season isn't very indicative of how a team uh, will perform in the playoffs, and that maybe the first month of the season is more indicative of how a team will perform in the playoffs. That's a, a lot of, you know, that's that's kind of in the data. But, um, but yeah. So if you believe that, then you would think, oh well, once the playoffs comes, Memphis can get back to the way they were earlier on in the year. They haven't really. But then you look at, it, well, they're not the same team. They they added Jeff Green. They're not the same team. They they made a trade here and there. They really they really do need some outside shooting, which they just don't have anywhere. Mike Conley's like really their only their only guy who's consistent from I guess Courtney Lee a little bit. Um, but that's like the one thing that they're really missing is they just don't have a three point shooter, which is it's just really tough to win this year in this day and age without three-point shooting well the irony is i think they had to give up i think they had to give up pondexter in the jeff green trade to make the salaries work but then he went to new orleans and he's been great for them yeah <laughs> he's, he's been, been better uh, than jeff green yeah for sure yeah he was he's been a, a really good a really good three-point threat for for new orleans for the last stretch for sure he's been playing really well you know, we were talking about Duncan being a center or, or a forward. I personally think he's a center. I mean, Splitter started 35 games this year. Uh, yeah. Diaz started 14. Bain started 15. But he's playing 15 minutes a game. When they go crunch time, almost always at this point, Duncan's a center. I, I, I might end up – I don't know. I, I have to see how Memphis finishes the year. If they're a two-seed, I think you have to go with Gasol. But uh, the, the other interesting All-NBA guy – is what the hell do you do with Ka- with Kawhi? Because he right. missed you know sixteen seventeen games and was clearly hurt and not shooting that well the first half of the season. But I think for the past four or five weeks he's been he's been in the conversation for one of the best five six players in the league. So what do you do with him? He's my MVP. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there you go. And that's just like I don't. I watch him play. He 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 doesn't. You know he didn't guard Harden for the whole game yesterday or at all really. But um, he's more efficient than a lot of the other team's best players that he's that he's tasked upon guarding. Like he's going to get a run at Chris Paul if they play the Clippers for like a quarter. He's going to get him or for a stretch. He's going to get James Harden for a stretch. He's going to get Stephen Curry for a stretch. I mean, it's crazy how, and he's so good defensively. It's just a, it's almost it's almost unfair. And it's, and it's funny they they let him they kind of let him go crazy on offense earlier on in the year. Yeah. Where they were just, I mean, they weren't, they were kind of deviating from their Spurs plan of, of like, you know, passing the ball like 150 times a possession or whatever, where they were just swinging the ball around for over and over and over again. They kind of deviated from that when he was healthy and he came back just so they could kind of get him going and let him post up a lot and let him ISO and let him do all these things that, you know, Pop never really lets anyone do. And then it just, it, it just makes him, it just, it just made him better and more confident. And, and yeah, he's, I mean, he's not my MVP, I suppose, because he hasn't played enough minutes and he doesn't play enough minutes in a game. He hasn't played enough games. 
but I can't think of any one player who impacts the outcome of a basketball game on both ends of the floor more than him when he's on against the really, really good teams. I mean, LeBron obviously would be the other one, but aside from that, uh, it's it's crazy how good he is defense is. And, uh, I mean, it depends on your on your – what you think an MVP is, right? Like some people just think it's been the best. It's the best player. What is some, MVP? Is it supposed to be the best player? Is it supposed to be the most viable player in the league, or is it the most viable? What is it exactly? Well, it's that nobody's ever figured out the exact definition. And I think they kind of like it that way. But okay. you know, I think it's some sort of combination on the excellence that you had during the season, season, how valuable you were to your team. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, um. It sounds weird, but like if you just replaced the person we're talking about with an average person of their position, what would be the impact on the team? Which yeah. I, is one of my favorite things to look at. So I think like if you replace James Harden with Aaron Aflalo this season, what happens to the Rockets? Do they win thirty right. games? Yeah, you know, and that that would be his case for MVP. It, now Steph Curry, if the Warriors win sixty-seven to sixty-eight games and become a historically great regular season team. And he's the best player in that team and the guy who sets the chemistry and the guy who's responsible for all the spacing issues every defense has against him and all the other things he brings to the table, crunch time, uh, the ability to swing games. Um, how how much do you value that, that that's a historically great team? These are all these are all up to the vote, yeah. I guess. I think I think I mean I think Harden I mean I don't really know to be honest. I mean I went from Curry to whoever. I don't when you look at it what either way you described it, like which player I mean, if you look at Houston's mix-matched roster of weird players that they kind of just plug in and out, and yeah. you know, Harden really truly has the ball all the time. And you know, the only take, you know, the only thing you can take away from Harden is that you need to be able to play some defense. Like people say, oh, you can't be that bad at defense and be a, but he's not that bad as bad as he used to be. Um, he's, but he's, yeah, Harden he's does average everything. Now, he's, I think. Yeah, he's he's below average, but he's. The thing about him is he can't be a good defender. It's if you look at his physique and you look at his body style and it's not like he's, you know, cut from stone or anything. He's not in, he's not in, in superb he's never just going to have like a great 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 physical thing where he's going to be able to play both ends super. He's not like Kawhi. Like if you look at if you were to put the two of them side by side, you wouldn't say oh athletes both of them, right? right. You wouldn't know what James Harden was. But because he's just he's a lot he's a different type of player. So if he has to expend as much energy he does on offense, you know Kawhi doesn't have to expend any energy on offense. James Harden has the ball the entire game. He's bringing the ball up the court. He's basically creating almost all their three point looks are based on him getting a bunch of attention, making these crazy passes, either penetrating and kicking. I mean he does everything. So because of that, you can't ask him to play a lot of defense because he's just not going to be. That's what you saw in the playoffs when he actually had to play defense last year in the playoffs and teams focused on him. He fell apart. In the fourth quarter yeah and so that's a really that's a real tricky thing for them i i do think that that um a player who 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 is an mvp candidate who isn't Kawhi, who is kind of silly but although i do think that he should be in the if he played a lot more it, it would be chris paul because if you look at that clippers team and you look at we both thought wow blake griffin's out this team could fall and they not only did they not fall they held it together playing Hito turkaloo big minutes at the four yeah. And playing Spencer, starting Spencer Hawes, who's, who's, who's been terrible. Awful. Yeah, it's their team is awful. They have like a great starting five, and but even the starting five, it's like Matt Barnes isn't creating anything on his own. JJ Redick isn't creating anything on his own, unless you think running around screens, which is important, and he does do that well. And so he is creating that space in that sense. But he still needs someone to like draw some attention and give him the ball. DeAndre Jordan is not a post threat. Um, Chris Paul is their best offensive player and their best defensive player by a big margin, and um, and that team has played quite quite well. If you look at their benches, is historically bad. Five through fifteen is is you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't you could pick anyone off the street and they would probably come up with a better five through fifteen. Like just a casual basketball fan, someone listening to this podcast could do a better job five through 15 of putting the Clippers roster together than, than what Doc Rivers has done. Oh, poor GM Doc. 
You know, the red, Reddick's been really good this year, but I, I'm with you on Chris Paul. I think if you're making if you're making the case for Harden, like that nobody does more for his team than James Harden, Chris has to be in that conversation too because, you know, like the game I went to last week where they played the Warriors, he guarded Steph Curry that whole game, you know, yep. and he he was balls to the wall on both ends. I think Harden's a better defensive player than you do. I, I think he's mediocre and he gets steals, you know. Like he's not, he's not a liability. He's not Damian Lillard. No, um, he's not Damian Lillard, but he will. The thing is, is like he picks the, his the more. My point is, the more he has to play good defense, the worse he's going to be on offense. Yeah, that's and I'm fair. not sure what's better for their team. Yeah, that's fair. Him, uh, him reserving his time and his energy for offense, or him playing terrible defense and playing great offense. That's tricky. You know, when 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 Howard's back there, he can kind of get away with it a little bit more. He can kind of loaf around um, a little bit just because you got the you know you got someone like Howard back there, right. It's funny that uh, Doc traded Jared Dudley. Jared Dudley was hurt all last season. Yeah. And and Doc knew he was hurt, and he didn't play him, and for whatever reason, he fell out of favor. Right. Then he used a future first-round pick just to get Jared Dudley off the team so crazy. to Milwaukee, and he's been playing almost 24 minutes a game. I'm looking at the stats right now, 23.7 minutes a game, 40% from three. He yep. plays crunch time for them routinely. At the um, four, which is insane. Yeah. And he, he's kind of exactly what the Clippers needed, somebody yep. who could play the three and the four and shoot threes, and and they traded him with a first-round pick. That might have been secretly the worst trade of the last year. Well, yeah, the thing there's a couple things. And if you read the article, I think I don't know if it was an article or if it was a podcast that Zach did. It's a podcast. Did. Okay. Not only, did he, not only was he injured, but he was – he was asked to play injured, and he specifically said, I will play. Like, you know, Doc went to him and said, hey, we need you to play. We know you're hurt. And he's like, I don't know if I can go, but I'll give it my best. So he, it's not even like, okay, he was injured, and he, and maybe Doc didn't. He, he knew he was injured, and he wasn't even able to play, and he forced them to play, and he, he decided to play. Um, it's crazy. They got rid of him, and, and they got rid of Bledsoe so they could get, I mean, I don't know. The Bledsoe thing isn't that big a deal, but the the – the Dudley, the Dudley thing was just terrible. The Dudley trade is terrible. Dudley was the problem. Dudley had was he didn't he just didn't have it like a you know, he never played in the Eastern Conference when Doc was a coach. Had he played in the Eastern Conference when Doc was a coach, he would have realized that he could actually play back in the day, and that maybe he just would just fight through the injury and see what he see what he's like when he's healthy again. Because if you look at all the players that he adds to his team, they're all these guys who played in the Eastern Conference and played him in a playoff series or played for him. It's so crazy. I was laughing when. I've talked about this before, but when he signed Byron Mullins two summers ago, and Byron Mullins had had the game of his life against the Celtics, and it was just like Byron Mullins is terrible. So you know, bad. It's like wow, is this is really a, a based off this one great game he had? Yeah. It it's like where the league is going though is just nuts to me. Like you'd think it's 2015. There's only 30 NBA teams, and there's all these allegedly smart people who own the teams who have succeeded in other aspects of their life, save for gym bus, people like that. And yet we still have situations where the coach is running the Clippers, where Vlade Divac just got hired to run the Kings. He hasn't even been in the NBA in the last 10 years. He's been like chain smoking for the last 10 right, years somewhere in, 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 in Belgrade or something. Yeah, yeah it's so crazy. Li- living in Belgrade. Uh, yeah. But you go on down the line, like the Denver guy, I don't know how that guy got his job. Um, but you going down the line, it's like, it's just, if I was like an assistant GM for a good team, I would be going crazy that these jobs were opening and closing and I, and I didn't even have a chance for them. It is. Yeah. The, the, the doc rivers thing is, is, is really puzzling because I don't know. It's just in general, it's just really, really hard to be a GM and a coach. I mean, it's like what you talked about. You, you pick players that, that you coached that played a good game in the game you were coaching. I mean, how much time does Doc Rivers have to to scout and to do all the stuff that you need? Like, if you follow, like, someone like, you know, Daryl Moore is probably the most public GM, right? Yeah. He's on Twitter. He's posting where he, he tells, you know, he's, the guy's traveling all over the world looking for players and talent and, for, and doing all these things. He's managing an analytics team, which is all the things that GM should be doing. He's not t- coaching 82 games a season. It's yeah. just very, very, very hard. And the other thing is, is they had a good GM. They had it. I used to make fun of the guy because he was like a soap opera actor originally. But right. uh, Neil O'Shea was a good GM for that team. I mean, he uh, he he's a guy who can who can who who was actually a decent GM. And then 
now they've got you know basketball doc the coach and doc the gm and doc the president and i don't know i mean i just it's just it's kind of unfair because i'm not a huge clippers fan i, I had season tickets for a long time i got rid of them after the strike year just because they just kept on ride you know raising the prices over and over again i found i wasn't going to any games and i was like giving them to like my cleaning lady and stuff or giving them away on twitter it just became just a waste i should have kept them but um uh they have like you know chris paul DeAndre Jordan, Blake Griffin, that's a pretty good big three. And yeah. to just piss it away because you can't fill the roster with the parts that are the easiest. Those are the easiest players to fill your roster with. I mean, you can you should be able to find a better point guard than Lester Hudson. You should be able to I mean like a backup three point guard than and and then you're and then Austin Rivers make a trade for Austin Rivers who is, you know, pretty much unanimously thought of as like a terrible player around the league and i don't know it's just almost it's it's i feel sorry for i mean it's hard to feel sorry for a guy worth 24 billion or whatever much money Balmer's worth but i kind of feel bad because i feel like he bought this team he paid he overpaid for it but whatever um and now he's like bought the he's drinking the doc kool-aid and letting them run the entire team and it's just it's it's kind of uh I liked it a lot better. Let me put it. I liked it a lot better when Doc was the coach and the GM when, when, uh, when, uh, when Sterling was the owner. I didn't mind it so much then. Now I just feel like, oh, it's a shame. They could be a powerhouse if they really, if they really had a decent general manager. Well, it's weird that you would buy, you'd spend that much money on the team and then not really make a priority of assembling the right front office. Like, and also the president they hired. There's been a lot of shaky stuff coming out about her too. Like, right? She's she's obsessed with like game presentation and. Stupid yeah, I just stuff, think he but... doesn't know. I mean, doesn't, he's no, not. I don't think so either. Yeah, he's he's not a basketball guy. He wasn't ever. He's like he's a, obviously a very smart guy, but his, his expertise doesn't. Kind he's he's enough. He's he's smart enough of a person to realize I don't. I should just leave this in charge of the experts. But I think he'll figure it out after a while. Like he can read newspapers. I think he knows that that people are looking at this bench that they've put together and are kind of like. Wow, it's got you know the crazy thing is, is like Turkoglu. We make fun of him. Turkoglu has actually played pretty good of late. I know I mean, he has he's actually, moments. Yeah, he's actually he can actually still play okay. It's kind of I don't know if he's what the deal is, but you know, Turkoglu is my, of all the signings that he's made. Turkoglu is probably the worst, the, the the best of the worst signings. If that makes sense. He's probably it's, it's, that. I mean, we're being harsh on the Clippers, but at the same time, man, you look at like if they can get Jamal healthy, and uh, and they're and you're playing them in the playoffs, and you're going against Chris and Blake, who are two of the best twelve players in the league. J.J. Reddick's having a career year. DeAndre's having one of the great contract runs of all time. Yeah. You know, it's like they have five five really good guys. for. They can get 38 minutes a night from their starters, which you can in the playoffs because the game slows down. And I don't just mean the, 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 the pace of play. I mean, like, with commercials and the, there's, longer, there's more breaks. It slows down in that sense. If you can get 38 to 40 minutes from those five guys, uh, and then have your bench come in and play as slow as possible in the game, minimize the number of possessions so they minimize the horrible effect they're going to have. Like, don't have Austin Rivers playing fast, have them playing slow, you know, maximizing time, and play good defense. Those guys can play decent defense. They can do very little damage. The Clippers can... I mean, the Clippers are better than Portland. I don't think Houston wants to play the Clippers at all. Uh, They have no shot against the Spurs. The Clippers, they cannot beat the Spurs. And they might not uh, have to play them till round three. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. They're, they've got the best spot. Like, I don't know if they'll stay in fifth, but that's like the Jesus spot. The fifth spot where you play Portland and you have home court advantage is like the spot you want to be in for the first round. The bad news of that is, is that you're going to have to play Golden State in the second round. But, like, right. for the first round, the five spot is really good. Really, this, the, the ideal spot you want to be in is the two spot, obviously, because you're going to have... Dallas in the first round, which I don't think anyone's really afraid of, and you're going to have home court for the next two round, for the next round, and then you're going to have Golden State. So if it's really interesting, if if the Spurs get up to the second spot, they're a lock for the Western Conference Finals, in my opinion. Um, and I think that's that's actually has a really good chance of happening. Yeah, there. Look, the Clippers, Spurs, Rockets, and Grizzlies all have uh, 53 wins. Yep. Uh, pretty crazy. 
Which coach are you more excited to have going against Golden State in round one, Monty Williams or Scott Brooks? I want I want Monty Williams just because I want something different. I'm just the Scott Brooks thing. It's and all and that Oklahoma City team is completely given up. Um, yeah, they have. They're just done. They're just tired. You could just see like the the game after uh, Durant was announced out for the year. Westbrook had just like a horrible game, and I was like me being the robot that I am, <laughs> thinking people don't have any emotions. Like, Why is he playing so bad? What is wrong with him? And then, then I was like, oh, uh, maybe it's the fact that Kevin Durant has announced out for the year. That yeah, and they can't guard it. anybody. I think Golden no. State would sweep Oklahoma City. They might be able to get, like, one game, and, you know, it's tough to play a game in Oklahoma. They might, I mean, whether they sweep them or beat them in five or six, it doesn't matter. They're never losing the series. Um, I think they're certainly never losing the series against New Orleans either. But they got to sweat out. New Orleans, when it, you get, you might have to sweat that one out a tiny bit. No, New Orleans is like secretly scary. No, they're terrible. They're, they're like, scary a little bit. Hey, when they're when it when it's like a one point game and they're running that Tyreek Anthony Davis high screen, I'm I'm scared if I'm the other team. I don't like yeah. that play. Well, there's like there's there's just I mean they're not they're not terrible, but they're just not able to beat. Like Golden State, I think is not a worried of. Worried about oh, no, they're, they're winning either series. I just think yeah. New Orleans would make them at least have to break a sweat a couple times. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't think that I – don't, I don't know that Draymond Green is the best matchup for Anthony Davis. I don't no. think that that's – and but I but I think that they just have lots of guys. They can, they can throw Iguodala on them. They can put Green on them. They can maybe even try Bogut on them just to, like, punish them a little bit. Um, well, what, Golden, what's interesting, though, so is if – if Drew Holiday came back in time for that series, right? He's a Big really difference. good defensive player. I, I, he just is. I think he's one of the best five defensive players at that position. Yeah, and, no, uh, that's a good point. If Drew, if Drew Holiday comes back, and and then th- that also has the added benefit of not having Tyreek Evans like completely mangling the entire late game over and over and over again, because um, he's just not very good at the end of game situations. I know you're scared of that high screen pick and roll, but it's much more scary when it's Drew Holiday versus Tyreek Evans. Right. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that there's much of a precedent for a player missing that much time and coming back and playing well for playing well in the playoff season if he does come back. I'm, I'm looking for, I, I want I want New Orleans. I don't know that New Orleans holds on to it because I still think they have a very, New Orleans has a very tough schedule. Yeah. They play, they finish out with, they finish out with um, at Houston versus, I guess it's not that tough. They play, they play at Sun, they play at home versus San Antonio at the end of the season, which could be a game that San Antonio needs to win to get the second seed. Um, they play at Minnesota, which should be a win. That's they in, play at Houston, which is probably a loss. That uh, last game on April fifteenth is home against San Antonio. And if you and you and I have, we really enjoy the Pelicans and and Monty just in general. But right, they, there's just no doubt in my mind that their playoffs are going to come down to the last two minutes of that Spurs game, and they're going to have a lead. <laughs> And then comedy is going to ensue, and I don't know Probably. if they're going to pull it out or not. But I just—it has to end this way, I think, for them. It just has to. I don't know. Yeah, they both both actually they they both teams have a similar schedule. Oklahoma City plays Portland and Minnesota as well, but then they play at Indiana and versus Sacramento. I don't know. I, it's weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, Oklahoma City's lost four in a row. It's pretty crazy. They lost they lost four games in a row, and they've lost six of their last. Seven. Don't they have Pretty to? Strong. They have to beat Oklahoma City. I mean, they have to be one game ahead of New Orleans, or else they don't get it. Right. New Orleans has the tiebreaker because yeah. of the head-to-head record or whatever. The tie first. They have the tiebreaker. I'm not sure what the reason is, but they have it. Um, hey, there. There's no chance that uh, that the Mavs are going to turn on some invisible invisible switch that I'm not seeing. Right. Did you read the article on? The the the, Rajon, the genius that is Rajon Rondo. Yeah, who knew? I I thought right. it was a very well written article. I loved it, but man, who who knew that he was the most calculating genius America has ever produced? <laughs> I know, right? I'm, I think the article was really good too. I didn't, wasn't meaning to disparage the article, but yeah. uh, my point is that he maybe maybe I because may, I think he's terrible, and maybe I'm just I just haven't seen playoff Rondo. Maybe I'm just because you know he did have that game against Boston where he played great. That's like the one game against. The one game for the Mavs that he actually played great was the one <laughs> the one against Boston, and National then he had another TV game Rondo. where, yeah, and then he had another game where Monte was was out where he played pretty good. Um, Mav, I mean, I don't know the Mavs. The if the Mavs play the Spurs, they're probably not going to win. If they play Houston, they could beat Houston. 
Houston doesn't have Nemo, and they don't have Patrick Beverly for the rest of the year. Um, I can I, I have one more point on that because I agree with you. I, I think Houston is very very beatable in round one, and I think one of the reasons is I think playing that team six or seven times in a row would be an advantage for the team that's playing Houston because, as you said earlier. Everything is hardened. It's just the same thing over and over and over and over again. I think the more you play against that, the easier it would be to figure it out. Does it make yeah. sense? Yeah, that does. And then also, um, it just it's it's just easier to defend. I think there's lots of things you can do to to to, to hurt a player like that. Like if, if one of these smart teams in the playoffs is going to hound him for the entire game. Like yep. the idea that he brings the ball up the court, he will not be doing that in the playoffs. They're going to have to have Jason Terry bring up the ball or something because if he has to bring up the court and now, you remember what you know, Dallas did this versus LeBron in the finals, and it had such a huge impact, incremental impact as the game went on. There were that JJ Barrera picking him up full court, right? And if so, if Harden is, is forced to you know to, to bring the ball up the court that eight seconds and have to get past the press, or even if he just has to pass and get out of the way. Now you can do the ball denial thing where it's going to be tough for him to get the ball. And my that sort of thing, if a team does that, that's like a very, very, very easy way to take away a lot of what he does because you're just going to exhaust him. Well, there's two other have... things you can do, right? You can run him off screens on the other end. Yeah, and, then... and that's the other thing. Yeah, you run him off a lot of screens on the other end. And then the third thing, and this is something you, you, you're going to see more of in the playoffs, and this is something Portland did to him last year a little bit. You just got to hammer him on the fouls. Like If, you, if yeah. he's going to the free throw line, make him pay for it every time. Yeah. I think he gets frustrated, and I don't think he likes – I think he's so used to getting hit. I don't think – he's like Blake in the way that when there's a little bit extra, it kind of bothers him. Would bother I would anyone. be trying to get in his head <laughs> every game. Yeah. There, I, I, think, think, I think in the playoffs, it's like what you just said is very – a team – that is smart and knows what to do can neutralize him a lot. Well, same same goes for you know any great player, but I think because that team has really has nothing else, he just can't sit around. You know, if he if he's tired, they're not going to be able to put him in the corner and let what let the the, the Jason Terry, uh, Joey Dorsey two man pick and roll. I guess maybe they could they could, you know Howard they can go with Howard in the post, but Dallas. My point is, I don't see them having the two seed to begin with. I think it's a moot conversation because what's going to happen is they play they play Houston again, or excuse me, they play San Antonio again. I think San Antonio probably beats them again. Yeah, and then it just becomes at that point it becomes very very tough for a team to get the two seed if they if they pick up two losses in their last four or five games. Well, so, their worst case their worst case scenario. I, I hate to do rock paper scissors when we don't know what the matchups are, but if they play the Spurs, it's over. Kawhi just yeah. takes out Harden, and, and that's it. You might I don't even know if you'd have to watch all the games in that series. Um, I think I think any team that is going to face the Spurs in the first round, I don't know a lot of what's going to happen in the playoffs, but I'm pretty confident Golden State and the Spurs win their first round series. So yeah, yeah I don't. I, that would be a nightmare matchup. I don't know that it could happen. I don't know. I, Memphis. This is like the real interesting part of the season. I don't know. I don't know which of these teams like Memphis plays has three of their next four games on the road. They play at Utah, at Los Angeles, at Golden State, and versus Indiana. That's probably the toughest schedule of all, I would say, of those this, teams. This Golden State team, how high are you on them? Um, real high. They're the best team in basketball. I, I, I think that that's – I mean, I don't know. I, I think that, yeah, I'm real high on them. They're smart. They're good. Um the only issue I have with them is they haven't really played any close games at all. Uh, I mean, that's that's like the big knock on Curry's MVP race is he's sat the fourth quarter in a lot of these blowouts, right? Yeah. They haven't really been tested in any way. Um, but yeah, I'm high on them for sure. I mean, I'm looking forward to the second round of the West more than the first round because I think the second round is going to be like, you're going to have just two amazing series for sure. And that's going to be really, really exciting. I'm pretty high on them. I mean, I think it's, it just comes down to how many of the bad teams, how many of the good teams do they have to go through to get there? And whereas, you know, Cleveland might just be able to... Okay, so there's... I think basically Golden State beats every team but but two in the league, for sure. And those Who two are the teams two? are Cleveland and the Spurs. Those are the two teams. I don't see Golden State losing to any combination of any other teams other than those two teams. 
So it's just a question of then they're probably going to have to beat both those teams, whereas the, you know, the Cavs are only going to have to beat one team, probably, that team in the finals. I don't think Atlanta's going to give them quite the quite the bit of trouble. That some, I mean, I just think that Atlanta's not ready to go to the finals. I don't think they have the types of players who they're they're not going to be able to. I mean, I don't know. It's possible, I suppose. I just think that LeBron's just a little more tested and, and tried, and I'm not sure that Budenholzer is is that much of an advantage over Blatt, which I do think he is. I don't know. I mean, they, it, it depends. A lot of it depends on, like you said, Millsap and Cephalosha, um, where those two things, how that how that happens. And and and, but Cleveland is playing pretty good right now. That they they, they deserve a lot of credit for the type for the trades they've the in season trades they've made because they went from a team everyone was laughing to they're going to fire. You know, Blatt was like surely to get fired soon to what like, catapulting up now to the second seed in the playoffs. In their conference, and really only having to worry about um, Atlanta, which is pretty, pretty tough. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. If if if, if Chicago's in the four and five spot, I think it's it's then then Atlanta has a really tough spot because now they're going to have to beat whoever they beat in the first round, which is no problem. But then they're going to have to play the the Bulls probably in the second round, which is probably going to be a physical series, which they'll probably win. Um, whereas Cleveland is going to have to beat what? Maybe the Celtics, maybe the Nets. And then what? The winner of the Toronto Milwaukee series is, is that anyone that you'd worry about if that happens three versus six? So I don't know. Yeah, those are the two teams I I see beating Golden State. The only two teams: the Spurs and the Cavs. Whereas there's other teams that I could see a bunch more teams beating them. It's funny if it's Toronto Milwaukee in round one, which is possible. I do think Would Milwaukee could that? beat Toronto. You think Milwaukee could beat Toronto? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I'm um, not saying they will. I'm just saying that it would not shock me if Milwaukee beat Toronto. It would shock me if Milwaukee beat Chicago. But yeah. I, I just think Toronto and Washington could lose to anybody. I don't think it matters. Those teams have been 500 teams for three months now. You know. Yeah. Washington really suffered when Beal went out. That was yeah. pretty much what, what did them in. I think they've played a little bit better since he's been back. Um all these playoff series are really interesting because it's all about matchups. Yeah, it's, it's it's this team plays well against that team, but couldn't beat that team. Who can beat this team? And it's it's kind of interesting in that way. And so you don't really have like aside from Golden State and San Antonio and Cleveland, which are dominant teams. The rest of the teams could get knocked out in the first round or could go to the could you know could go to the second or third round. The Celtics got a huge break because Cleveland clinched too, and I think LeBron's probably going to sit out. The the Celtics have back to back against Cleveland. Yeah. Probably not Maybe, LeBron in though. those games. Um, it's a, it's weird, but they've I mean they've got fifty one wins over forty six. They had theoretically clinched a long time. Like they didn't have to play yesterday. True, and true. they did. It's weird. I don't know. LeBron's played a lot of. I mean that that rest really did him in for sure. It really really or didn't did him in, but it really helped him a lot. Yeah. But he's also still played. Blatt's got curious. Curious. I mean he's he's playing thirty six minutes a game. I don't know why he's playing thirty six minutes. They should really realize that the that just making the playoffs is enough for that team and being healthy kind of like what the Spurs did last year that should right. be the goal I suppose not trying to play the guy 35 and 36 minutes he's got some weird substitution patterns black for sure um Kyrie Irving were you a fan of his as recently as January no I mean I've always been a fan of his offensive game he had he was putting up he had like a few 40 50 whatever point games before when he was younger I don't think anyone's ever doubted his his offensive ability to play basketball, I think it was always his, his ability to play defense and his ability to play within a system. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of bought in. I mean, there was one game where he had zero assists this year. How could you be a fan of a point guard who plays a game of basketball with zero assists, right? Right. That's and why I, think I didn't that like was, him. You know, that, was, that was kind of, I think, the turning point. I think there was, like, talk that LeBron and him got into it after that game. And, I think you know that was probably he realized that team moves the ball really really well now. Um, they don't really move the ball like the Spurs do, where it's it's the ball moves, but the players don't necessarily move. Where the Spurs have player movement and ball movement, which I think is key. Whereas a lot of these other teams just have the ball movement, where the ball just swings around. It's kind of like hot potato sometimes. Yeah, the key is having the play. So so um, yeah, I was never really a huge Kyrie Irving fan. I'm uh, I was always a fan. I always liked watching them play. But I was never like, oh, that's a guy who can, you know, really be your starting point guard. I mean, he's no Chris. I'd still rather take Chris Paul over him in a heartbeat, and I'd rather take obviously Curry over him. But he's a good player. Uh, 
I think I, I guess even... the team has really bought in on defense too, so which is big. I guess the team is defending a lot better now. Yeah, well, partly because they also have better defenders. I mean, those two trades really helped them. And the, yeah, they just robbed. I mean, obviously the Knicks were just trying to super tank, but yeah, picking up J.R. Smith and Shumpert were two really big. I mean, those are two perfect keys for that team. Two guys who don't need the ball a lot and yeah. two guys who can shoot well and one who plays extremely good defense and the other one who, who can play defense sometimes if he wants to. Um, I don't think... See, I don't think I, it took me a while to get to this point, but I don't even think a Kyrie is a point guard anymore. I just think he's Tony Parker with even less sort of playmaking. He's a, he's a scorer who happens to be built like a point guard. I think right. The, the, yeah, that's that's a fair thing. And then LeBron has the ball most of the time anyway. Yeah. LeBron's the one calling the plays and has the ball and, and initiating all the action. So that's I a fair. I'm, I couldn't reconcile how Kyrie was going to be on a good team with his style. Because just fundamentally, it's like, well, he's not a point guard. This will never work. But now you see him with LeBron. It's like, oh, that's actually the perfect guy for him. The other yeah. thing that's good for them is, you know, I, I mean, it's a totally different team. The first 35 games, 40 games of the year or whatever, it, it was just a chore to watch them. I just didn't enjoy watching them. As you said, now they play defense. They move the ball. They're good at home. I don't think they've – I think they were uh, – what were they, 19 and 20 at one point? I don't think they've lost at home since. That was the team that I was expecting. I, I thought they were going to be this team that just had a ton of energy at home and were going to be really, really hard to beat there. And I think they've actually established yeah. that now. I like that team, well, though. Yeah, they're the prob- I mean, I, they're probably the best offensive team with their current roster that we've seen in a long time. I mean, that team should be able to score in, in just a myriad of different ways. They've right. got like the perfect... They got like the one big, the stretch four, which everyone wants, and then shooters all around. Um, it's pretty special to watch at times. Yeah, they're they're going to be they're going to be a really really tough 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 team for Atlanta to get through, which is kind of a shame because Atlanta's had such a great season. Now they have to face this juggernaut. And they have something that Golden State has, and I think Oklahoma City had a couple years ago when Harden was on that team, where they could be down seventeen with eleven minutes left and still win the game. They they yeah. can put huge batches of points up in short amounts of time. Golden State can do it with the threes. Cleveland can just do it by just Kyrie and and LeBron doing dueling banjos and getting the rim over and over again. Yeah, um, they're you just never they're going to win a playoff game in one of the first two rounds where they're going to be down fifteen on the road and you're going to think the game's over and then all of a sudden they're going to be winning by five. They're just super duper explosive. I. I, I, I really wanted the Atlanta thing. I wanted to be on that corner. I wanted to be like, oh, no, it's pace and space, team basketball. It's going to beat this. And the more I watch Cleveland, I'm just like, man, I, I just don't I don't see how anybody beats them until the finals. Yeah, the issue I have with Atlanta is um, is the health of those two players. And then I just don't – I guess Damari Carroll can guard him and Tabo, if he's healthy, can guard him. But mm. I don't know who else they have to guard LeBron. And it just becomes really tough. The, the, it's it's it's. I'm I mean, I'm not saying Cleveland would for sure beat them. I I just think they would be a favorite to beat Atlanta. Atlanta could still do some things that could maybe that could maybe you know depending on what type of adjustments they do have a good coach. Um, it'll be interesting. It'll be a fun series to watch for sure if if and when it gets to that. So we don't recommend any long shot bets. No. Anytime you're going to bet like one of these teams. In the playoffs, that has like really, really short odds or long odds. You're just better off just betting them individually in series, as I would say. But there are no real like, you know, a dark horse that that's never happened in the NBA. Can you think of a time in the NBA where a dark horse has won the title? It's just the the the, the dominance of the teams in the 82 game schedule. Really, Dallas was the only one. That was it. Yeah, I would say Dallas was. Dallas had to have been like at least 12 to one heading into that playoffs. Thing, Dallas was an underdog in every series they played. Yeah, I was thinking that's, maybe maybe the '09 Magic came close. Yeah, but they didn't close, end up winning. They still it. didn't. Yeah, they still didn't get there. Yeah, that, well, that's the, the, the only team. O four Pistons, I think, going into that playoffs, everybody just assumed the Lakers were winning the title, so they must have. Yeah, they were a huge one. That's one. That's another one that was. They 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 weren't. They were a huge favorite in the East. I mean, they played Milwaukee in the first round. I think they were like eighteen to one or something like that. Yeah, but they were a big like ten to one. Or something, some big number dog versus the Lakers. But any basketball guy who watched basketball could see that that team, the, the Pistons team, was good, uh, was better. 
Yeah. And and you know the Lakers also lost Carl Malone. That killed and, them. Yeah, I mean they were playing Slava Medvedenko. Well, they, they were built. The <laughs> right, they were built like this Clippers a title team. Starting Slava Medvedenko at the four. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. I don't care who you have at the at the center position. Yeah, with Rick Fox thrown in, they had a. They were built a lot like this Clippers team, where they it was like basically four or five guys, but if any of them got hurt, it was over. It was done. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. The other one was um. The I, it, the O one Lakers. Who had like, and that was the one that you famously. Uh, the year wrote. before, but the next year, I actually they were seven to one going into the playoffs. The year, right. after, the year they repeated. That's what I mean. They, yeah, because they had had like this topsy turvy regular season. It was the first time Shaq and Kobe were battling a little bit, and yeah, going into those playoffs, I can't remember who the favorites were, but the Lakers were not one of them. I think the Kings were in there. And, yeah, the uh, Lakers had to play the Spurs with the Spurs having home court. And the Spurs yeah. were like a were like a three to one favorite. That to me was the best playoff basketball. I still haven't seen. I mean, last year Spurs team was pretty good, but it was in a different way. They didn't. The Spurs last year Spurs team didn't start blowing really teams out until the finals, and 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 it was just kind of it just they just did it in a different way. The Lakers team, that team was, yeah, I'm, that was they had, but they but they had started winning before. They had Derek Fisher was injured, and then he came back, and um. That was a team that was like the, the remember the Miami team that was like the the, the light switch team where yeah. they would just turn it on in the fourth quarter. That was like the very first in my memory because I haven't been following. I don't have like the historical basketball knowledge that you have. I just started like in 1995 or whatever or 2000. Um, that team was the one I remember that just had like okay when we have to try we'll try and until then just get leave us alone until we have to try. And Miami yeah, think, was like that too. Um, I I think the 01 Lakers. I've written this. I, I think that's one of the – that's probably the best playoff team of the last 20, 25 years. I mean, they, they really almost swept. swept the playoffs. Yeah, they almost swept. And, I, and they beat that Spurs team by like 20, 20. I mean, it was a joke. I remember yeah. thinking – because I had a really big bet on that on that, on that that team to win the championship. And um, I remember thinking, oh, I'm just only worried about the Spurs series. And I remember the first game – that went down in San Antonio. And I remember watching that game and being like a little bit worried going in. And then after like the second quarter, I was just like, this is a joke. This team can't play. Right. Um, and that it was, was funny Duncan. because they just pick and roll them to death. There was no talk of the triangle. There was no triangle. It was, Kobe. it was just pick and roll and kicking to open three point shooters or Kobe getting to the basket or Shaq dunking on the, on the dive. And there was no triangle at all. And now it's like, all these idiots are talking about how great the triangle was if you have the talent. And I was like, well, they had the talent then and they weren't winning with the triangle. It was all it was all pick and roll, drive and kick. So. Yeah, I had this thing called the 42 Club where it's basically like you add up somebody's points, assists, rebounds in the playoffs and it's 42 over. You know they had a hell of a playoffs. For okay. some reason, that was like the perfect number for it. And I think that 01 Lakers team, that was the only time somebody had two two guys in the 42 Club on the same playoff team. Kobe and Shaq were both like 30 a game and, you know, Shaq had 13 rebounds and Kobe had the rebounds and the assists. Like we'll, we'll probably never see that again where you have two yeah. of the best three players in the league on the same team. They regularly had games where, where those two guys scored more points than the rest of their team combined by like a big margin. Yeah. They would I put loved... up like 75 and the rest of the team would put up 20. That I would happen over and over, uh, and over again. I loved watching young Kobe too. I, I think people forget O O and O one Kobe, just when he was still feeling out like his athleticism. I mean, yeah. they played the Kings that year, and I think he had forty eight in game one. It was either game yeah. one or game four. He just dropped. He was like sixteen for twenty or something against them. Yeah. Uh, but that team was crazy. I, I'm with you though. The Spurs last year, they they hit a certain level that was really cool to watch. Those last uh, three games, it was they were, beautiful they were way to watch. up there. Yeah. Yeah. There's that thing on on YouTube. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's just Google Spurs beautiful game. It's like set to some classical in Aldi music or whatever. And it's um it's pretty amazing, and it just shows the ball movement that they had. And it's funny because there's there's a game that they played the year before. They played the Clippers, or maybe it was two years prior. It was when they played the Clippers, and they were losing by like 18 or 20 points or something like that to the Clippers. And I remember sitting there at Staples Center wanting to bet, like, live bet it, but I, I wasn't able to because I was at Staples. I'm, like, in the U.S., whatever. I remember thinking I was with the person I was with, and I was just like, 
She's like, this game sucks. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? There's no team. She's like, the black team sucks. I was like, no, the black team's winning this game. She's like, they're really? losing by 20. I was like, trust me, the black team's going to come back and make a game of it or win. And they just like completely tore through that team. And it was just the most, it was the most breathtaking thing to watch. And that was like when you really saw, I think that's when Pop really real, or you know, that's when he really saw, like, okay, this is how our team can play when we're clicking. And it's just scary because when they are playing like that, it's impossible to defend for one. You can't defend that at all. You can't yeah. just say, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this guy," and that's it. You know, like with the, with the with the Warriors, you can kind of do that a little bit. You can stop Curry, and then now you have to depend on the other guys playing four on three. And and but and with Cleveland, you can do that too. If you stop LeBron, the rest of the team is gonna get into all kinds of weird, ridiculous basketball situations. But there's no one on the Spurs. You just can't defend that type. But that's perfect basketball and and i don't think that you, that's almost solved basketball like the way they play is solved basketball if, you, if they can do that there's really no way you can defend it the only you can do is play it better than they play it in my opinion well and and obviously you're right because now you have all these teams trying to emulate it and and try to figure out their own versions of it like I, it certainly worked for atlanta atlanta's going to win 60 plus games and have the lowest point differential in the history of anyone who won 60 games they yeah, pays for that. It's the interesting to watch it. these teams try it though, because they miss like some of the very basic things that they like. I see teams like Toronto trying to do it sometimes, right? Yeah, and very rarely, but you know, Toronto will like walk the ball up the court, and they'll be like, they'll just you know, they'll be they'll be at eight, you know, they'll start the clock, and they'll they'll be at they'll, they'll start getting into their offense, and there'll be fourteen seconds left on the on the shot clock or less, and now they're going to do this elaborate ball movement. It doesn't work that way. The Spurs don't walk the ball up the court. You yeah. need a lot of time to get to, to, to run all these elaborate sets, you know, an, an elaborate flow offense where it's not even they're not even doing anything. It's just they try one pick and all it doesn't work. Now we're going to come back to the other side. And I know it's interesting. Atlanta's really the only team that gets it. You have to actually play fast, and by playing fast, I don't mean taking early shots. It means you have to get into the offensive end of the court fast so that you have time to go through all of this stuff and wait for the perfect shot or wait for the best shot that you can. So it's tough to do. It's you have then you have to have players who can who can believe in it and who are willing to pass up a good shot for what might what may be a better shot. Boston's tried to do it the whole year and they and the one thing they don't have is the three point shooters. Right. They, they started they, to get that now though. They, yeah, it's starting to come on. Yeah, they've just started now to have like Bradley and then uh Jarebko and, and Olenek and Solinger and those guys when they play Olenek and Jarebko together, they can't defend anyone. But nobody can defend them. Right. Uh, it's very tough to defend that team when when those two guys are out there and the and the floor is spaced and you have either Bradley Turner or Thomas driving. Um, it's fun. They do like a lot of weird pick and rolls too. Like they have the roll guy setting the screen on a pick and it's just they do like a lot of really really interesting stuff. I really love the way they play. They're the other team that, that that's trying, but you know they don't have the talent. They don't have the big three that that. The other thing, San Antonio has the talent and they have the system, which is obviously what you need. Yeah, and you need the point guards that can get to the rim, which yeah. which helps because that opens everything up. The Celts, one of the things they do is they they'll run like these triple handoffs. It just sometimes nobody will dribble for ten seconds, and it'll just be like almost like a like this they do that uh, weave. Yeah, it's like the four corners on acid or something, yeah. and they're just running handoffs on the top, and then all of a sudden somebody's exploding in the basket. I love I love watching them. I really enjoyed this season, even though they're not very good at, at basketball. But they're really well coached, and and the stuff they're trying makes sense. Like, and you think like these college guys that are coming in now, you have this first wave of people who are kind of built to play this style. Like I look at Kaminsky, and I don't know how much college you watch, but Kaminsky in Wisconsin, college. Kaminsky's perfect for this. Well, Maybe, there's, so there's know. a guy Kaminsky in Wisconsin who's basically a better version of Kelly Olynyk. Right. He's, okay. he, all he does is shoot. You know, he's a he's a stretch five. Okay. And he can not only shoot threes, but he has this weird barreling to the basket spin move that works, and he can post. Is that up the a guy that bit. they asked him? That they asked the Kentucky players at the press? Because the only thing I saw was the press conference. They yeah, said, the, what do you that think was of the it? press conference guy. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy said, "F that, whatever." <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Under yeah, yeah. His breath. Okay, yeah, okay, those guys. So yeah, that's that guy. Exactly. Okay. But you have now you have this generation of of these guys coming in who are who are kind of taught to play facing the basket and seven footers who can shoot threes and so I just think this style is going to keep going and going. I think the teams like the Grizzlies are just 
not going to be typical anymore. Even Detroit, yeah. you look at Monroe and Drummond trying to play together, and, and 20 years ago it makes sense, and now I don't know if you can have both. No, it's interesting. I think like there is a certain idea that if everyone is doing one thing, you can try to do the other thing. Like when everyone was doing what, you know, when the Spurs were the only ones doing that, it became like, okay, this is it. But I am interested to see what happens when everyone is trying to, because now it, it when, when everyone, when both teams go small and they have like just a very, it, it, it becomes different. Then now maybe it makes sense to have two big guys, which is, yeah. I think a lot of Memphis' success in the West has to do with that. It's very tough to play a team like that when you're not prepared for it. But it's not, you know, optimal basketball in any stretch. I don't know. The game will constantly be evolving. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when you have more and more teams try to emulate this style, what happens. Because yeah. then I think there's there's different things you could do, and I don't think it's playing too big. But there are different things you can do to kind of counteract it a little bit on defense, for sure. I don't know why no team has ever... It's interesting. Like, I don't think it would work. But it definitely would work better than what what happened. I don't know why any team hasn't tried like to play like a hybrid zone. Again, like if these guys are all moving around, why are you chasing them everywhere? That's why teams have like the Milwaukee's playing like that switching defense, and Golden State is playing that switching defense, where basically you have five interchangeable players. Yeah, that's really the solution to this type of offense. Is you have five players who can just switch every position one to five and they're all kind of inter interchangeable phoenix did that for a while recently too and they had some success on defense but then you really need to be able to um you really need good communication on defense because it becomes now you you, you get like well i thought we were supposed to switch there and you have players where two guys will be on one player so it, it, it does become difficult but that would be one way to counteract some of what these teams are doing is, is to really go to a really heavily switching offense or maybe even just altogether zone well, I know that's what the Celtics want to do this summer. I think Brad Brad Stevens wants a defense where, you know, like Jay Crowder is like the perfect Celtic. Like he can guard four positions. Yeah. And I think they want multiple guys like that. Guys that are just, you know, it just doesn't matter who's who's the guy they end up guarding. They can guard the guy as long as it's not a 6'11 guy. And that's the that, – that guy, the assistant coach for – um for uh for the bucks right now um that guy should be the uh the big defensive uh that guy should be a, a new head coach hire should, I, I don't the Thibodeau of this decade yeah he's like the dip of the new he's like the new um he's like the new uh the new defensive guy that that because that defense he started that defense if you look at when Lawrence Frank got fired in Brooklyn and then Everyone's like, oh, what a great job Jason Kidd has done. Well, okay, but Jason Kidd didn't do a very good job until he had this guy running his defense, basically. Right. And and um, that that's like the that's a beautiful defense to watch. I mean that that is I haven't seen teams that play that style of defense and Milwaukee plays it best um, are really really tough to score on. Uh, so yeah, that might be one way to counteract some of some of this offensive stuff. The other thing is is. Is, is just to do it better than the Spurs do, but good luck with that. Is it Joe Prunty? Is that who it is? Um, there's, uh, I'm trying to, I got this, I'm trying to see what, there's two of them. There's one guy, with, the guy with the glasses, I forget his name. There's like, there's the one, some people say it's Sweeney, but I don't oh, think Sean it is. Oh, Sweeney, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Well, it's uh, one of those guys, but I thought that was really the Sean reason Sweeney they traded. Sean Sweeney is the, is, the, is the guy who's, uh, that's who it is, Sean Sweeney. Oh, okay. Because that, that was the reason they traded for Carter Williams, because it, it, it tied into... You know, they didn't even care that he couldn't shoot. They're like, oh, we'll teach him how to shoot. But he fits in with this whole crazy swarming switching thing we're trying to do. And yeah. there are nights when you watch them and you go, damn, <laughs> this is – if if Carter Williams ever learns how to shoot and Jabari comes back, like this is suddenly a frightening team. I yeah. don't know if they're going to be able to keep Middleton, but uh, – Well, not but yeah, now they, that everyone thinks that Chris Middleton's like – the most viable player in the league after that Sloan conference is <laughs> the craziest thing in the world. It's like he's ranked number nine in the league and it's real plus the ESPN real plus minus. Um, but yeah, they could match. I don't know if he's unrestricted or restricted, but he's probably going to get a max contract offer, whether he's worth it or not. Uh, I guess now I everyone's hesitate. worth it. Yeah. I, I worry. I worry about them matching it because it does feel like the Brandon Knight trade was a little bit of a salary dump. It seemed like they didn't want to pay him. So yeah. I don't know if those it was guys just have of him. pockets. Though the owners of the team have some money for sure. I mean, they've got a very, very, very. Those guys are not. They're not. They're pin. They're not. It's not the Oklahoma City 
owners who are depending on a type of Chip technology states. that may or may not, you know, the price of oil really hurt them. These guys are hedge fund guys. They have a lot of money, Wes Edens, and, and then even like some of their minority partners, like David Einhorn, that guy's worth a couple billion. So they have, they're well, well pocketed. They're not like, they're not like Prokhorov or, or um, Balmer, but they're, they've got a lot of money. Well, so maybe, well-pocketed, but, sometimes the well-pocketed hedge fund guys don't necessarily want to spend money on the NBA team. Like, they bought the asset, which is the franchise, and they bought into the league, but then... Yeah, you know, that like, makes look sense. At what, but look I think these Philly guys did. also are going to the games, and they're excited, and they're, like, flying to see the games, and I, they want to win. I think these guys are... They're not just hedge fund guys, like, pocket, you know, pencil, pencil-pushing pencil hedge fund guys are looking at an asset. They're, like, guys who are kind of masters of the universe hedge fund guys who want to be successful. And they're smart enough to realize um, what is. I mean, the issue is is that they're just never going to get enough revenue because they're in Milwaukee. It's never going to be the same. I mean, if they were really interested in that, they would just have, they wouldn't have bought a team that they were required to keep the team in Milwaukee, right? Um, yeah, I they think they just they, wanted they wanted the house on the beach. They, they're still the they houses wanted, on the beach. They wanted one of them. Yeah. Exactly, and then and then they wanted something close to where they could travel from New York to to see the games. It's not too bad. Whereas if they moved the team to Seattle, it would be a lot different. But yeah, any any team that anyone who bought a team and decided to keep it in Milwaukee is probably looking at the asset too too much, right? I hope you're right because I, I I love Giannis. I don't know where Giannis's career is going, but I'm excited to watch it unfold. I, I'm excited I'm to watch him like learn. And try new different American things, like when he when he first had a smoothie. He tweeted, about right, right. It. I love America. First time taste smoothie. So yeah, he's like one of the few. He's like one of the few guys that that seems really, really interesting to watch him grow up right before right, right before social media. It's kind of interesting. All right. Well, we can follow you at uh, Haralabob on Twitter. H A R A L A B O B. And yep. we'll be checking in with you during the playoffs. I know you like to keep your, your wagering somewhat secret, but after you make the wager, you can talk about it. Yeah, I, I think I did last year. I gave out a couple. Maybe during the, the playoffs, the liquidity is a lot better. So um, I could probably, yeah, so maybe some, playoff, some, maybe some playoff picks or something like that might be coming. All right. I look forward to tweeting at you with two minutes left to go in that Pelican Spurs game. <laughs> in the Monty up goal. by one. It's going to be great. It's all leading to this. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. All right, Bill. Take care. Hey, it's Bill Simmons. Wanted to remind you we have a new podcast that I'm hosting called Bill Don't Lie, NBA only, every Monday. It is not a BS report. You have to subscribe to this on iTunes or get it on ESPN.com's Pod Center. It's called Bill Don't Lie, NBA guests every week, NBA talk every Monday. Check it out, iTunes, please. Hey, what you got there, Golic? The new Subway Chipotle chicken melt with guacamole. Man, that looks good. Yeah, this new guac is really bringing the flavor. Got one for me too, right? Well, yes and no. Uh, mostly no. Well, really, all no. Oy. Try the irresistible new Subway Chipotle chicken melt with guacamole, juicy grilled chicken strips with Monterey cheddar, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new guacamole made from ripe avocados with just a hint of jalapeno. Subway, eat fresh.